The Efficient Use of Steam by Oliver Lyle. First published 1947. Ninth Impression published 1968. In short, I expect almost totally to prevent waste of steam. James Watt, Letter to Dr. Lind, 1765. Forward. It is now more than ten years since Sir Oliver Lyle wrote The Efficient Use of Steam. In the meantime, over 20,000 copies of the book have been sold. This is a remarkable tribute to the skill of the author in presenting, for the first time, a mass of technical data and information in the form of a useful and practical guide to all concerned with the use of steam in industry and a sure indication that such a publication was badly needed. One of us, as Minister of Fuel and Power, had the pleasure of introducing this book in 1947. Now we both welcome the opportunity of commending this new impression and of recording our gratitude to Sir Oliver Lyle for the care and trouble which he has taken to ensure that it has been brought up to date. We hope that the efficient use of steam will have an even wider circulation than before, and that the information and advice which it contains will be applied by users of steam plant throughout the country. Preface to the Sixth Impression The opportunity has been taken in this new impression to bring many of the cost figures up to date, and for some hundreds of minor revisions to be made. Apart from a less dogmatic treatment of the behaviour of superheated steam for heating, there are no important additions, omissions, or alterations. O.L. London, 1958 Introduction Soon shall thy arm, unconquered steam, afar drag the slow barge or drive the rapid car, or on wide waving winds expanded bear the flying chariot through the field of air. Erasmus Darwin, The Botanic Garden, 1792 Steam is industry's most wonderful, flexible, adaptable tool. No self-respecting workman presumes to call himself by his craft name until he knows how to use and look after his hammer, chisel, saw, micrometer, mega, or even hod or larry. Yet steam users misuse and ill-treat steam, the beautiful heating and power tool, because they have never learnt how to use and care for it. Steam has tremendous advantages over other tools. Once its ways are known, it never slips, never breaks, never turns its edge. Everything, or almost everything, that needs to be known about steam is in the steam tables, or inspiring columns of figures with unalluring titles. There is nothing new about steam. Its properties have been known for 100 years, each generation simply adds another decimal place to these properties. The new knowledge that the war uncovered is the sad lack in only too many factories, large and small, of the simple principles governing the economic use of steam. Immense pains are often taken to capture an extra 2 or 3 percent in the boiler house, Yet the factory may be using two or three times as much steam as is necessary. This book is an attempt to gather together, for the benefit of the practical factory steam user, the essential information which should enable steam to be correctly used. About a third of the book has already appeared in the Fuel Efficiency Committee's bulletins. As far as possible, mathematics have been avoided. The most advanced mathematics in this book is a pair of simultaneous equations, but there is necessarily a good deal of arithmetic. Abbreviations have been borrowed from our transatlantic allies. For example, the cumbersome British contraction LB per square 
inch has been replaced by psi, and BTU has replaced BTHU. The first three chapters are largely theoretical. Some readers may find them a little dry. The author was strongly tempted to put them in an appendix, but as all but two of the subsequent chapters are built on the structure of the first three, it was felt necessary to start with the theoretical framework. Considerable trouble has been taken to make the index complete. Cross-indexing has been done often to the third and fourth generation, but cross-indexing is not 100% complete. By making the index a section index instead of a page index, it was possible to prepare the index unhurriedly while the text was being criticised and corrected. Where tables are short, they are first printed in the text to which they apply. Most of the tables are collected together at the end of the book for easy reference. The book is intended to be a practical manual. It is not a textbook. No attempt is made to describe the design and construction of the more important pieces of steam plant, boilers, engines, turbines, etc., though the behaviour of steam in some of these plants is discussed, often in great detail. Some of the explanations may not be scientifically correct, but the author believes that it is more important to be nearly right and understandable than to be academically accurate and incomprehensible. The author is insufficiently equipped to be academically accurate. The book would never have been possible without the help of many friends, whose brains the author has shamelessly picked. In particular, the following have given, often unconsciously, of their learning and experience. M. H. Adams, W. L. Badger, E. H. Blade, W. L. Boone, R. Carstairs, F. M. Chapman, W. Davies, J. Eisner, Oscar Faber, M. Francis, W. O. Goldthorpe, P. F. Grove, F. Courtney Harwood, A. H. Hayes, J. E. Hobbs, Philip Lyle, E. L. Lully, I. F. G. McVicker, J. B. M. Mason, A. Milnes, L. G. Northcroft, H. M. Peacock, J. Philip, E. G. Ritchie, Peter Runge, F. C. Sellens, F. Shakeshaft, C. E. G. Simmons, B. Smith, W. J. Sparks, I. M. Stewart, J. A. Weiss, A. L. Webber. In the case of those names bear asterisks, plagiarism has sunk to scissors and pastebrush. Those whose names carry daggers have read and criticised text, or corrected arithmetic. To all of these, the author is indeed grateful. To Ernest Grummel, Chairman of the Fuel Efficiency Committee, and to Angus McFarlane, Director of Fuel Efficiency, the author owes particular thanks for help and guidance. Much valuable information has also been obtained from manufacturers of repute. Finally, the author must thank W. A. Glover for translating some 400 rough sketches into pretty pictures, Phyllis Davies for hundreds of sheets of virtuoso typescript, J. A. C. Hugill and H. H. Buckley for reading, correcting, and revising the proofs. Although this book was written for the Fuel Efficiency Committee, although it has been read and criticised by a dozen people, and although much of its content has been taken from the work of others, the author alone accepts responsibility for the statements made and the views expressed. O. L. London, E. 16, 1946. Chapter 1. What Steam Is. Its Heating Properties. For hot, cold, moist, and dry, four champions fierce strive here for mastery. Milton, Paradise Lost, 1666. 1. Steam. In our factories, steam is used for heat and power, because it possesses many outstanding qualities. For example, it has a very high heat content, it gives up its heat at constant temperature. It is produced from water, which is cheap and plentiful. It is clean, odourless, and tasteless. 
Its heat can often be used over and over again. It can generate power and then be used for heating. It can be readily distributed and easily controlled. As far as steam for heating and process is concerned, there are just two fundamental things that govern everything. These are 1. The boiling point of water decreases with reduced pressure. 2. The latent heat, the heating heat, of steam increases with reduced pressure. As far as steam for power is concerned, there are also two basic rules. A. Use the highest practicable initial pressure and temperature. B. Use the lowest practicable exhaust, or back pressure. As far as steam for any purpose is concerned, there is another rule that is of universal application. Never permit steam to expand from one pressure to a lower pressure without getting some useful result from the expansion. In order to understand steam, it is desirable to have some idea of what is going on inside water and steam under all sorts of conditions. 2. Solid liquid vapour. Steam is water vapour. Many things can exist in the three different states, solid, liquid, vapour. We all know that the cooler the substance, the more likely it is to be solid. The hotter it is, the more likely it is to be a vapour. What is the mysterious change which affects substances so that a solid melts into a liquid, and a liquid can dry or boil into a vapour? 3. Molecules. All substances are built up of extremely small particles called molecules. These molecules are made up of even smaller particles called atoms, which in turn consist of even tinier particles. The essential difference between these various particles is that a molecule is the smallest particle of a substance which possesses all the chemical properties of the substance in bulk. In other words, the qualities that enable us to say, this is sugar, this is salt. Each molecule of ice, water, or steam is built up of two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. If all the molecules in ice, water, or steam are the same, why is ice solid, water liquid, and steam vapour? The answer is that a liquid contains more energy than its solid, and that a vapour contains more energy than its liquid. We might have said that water is warmer than ice, and steam is hotter than water. This answer would not always have been true. Ice and the water it is forming in have the same temperature. The water boiling in the kettle is at the same temperature as the steam coming from the spout. The energy that molecules, or any other substance can possess, is of two forms. Kinetic energy, energy of motion, and potential energy, energy of position. An aeroplane in flight has kinetic energy dependent on its speed, and potential energy dependent on its height. When energy is added to a substance under conditions that do not change the state of the substance, the energy takes the form of increased motion of the molecules, and is shown by a rise of temperature. When energy is added under conditions that change the state of the substance, the energy takes the form of change of position of the molecules, and is shown as a change of state without any change of temperature. 4. Liquid. The molecules in liquid are in constant motion, and their speed of movement is dependent on the temperature. The hotter the liquid, the faster do the molecules move. In a liquid, the molecules have a great attraction for one another, are very close together, and their range of movement is very limited. Owing to this congestion, and to their erratic movement, collisions often take place. As a result of multiple collisions, some molecules go, even for a short time, much faster than their fellows who may have been slowed or even stopped as a result of the collision. If such a speed merchant is travelling upwards at the surface of the liquid, it will jump out of the liquid into the air or vapour above. 
The more heat we add to the liquid, the faster go the molecules. The more molecules can escape. A childish analogy may help to explain how a molecule can reach a speed greatly above at the expense of its neighbours as a result of multiple collisions. By squeezing a wet cherry stone between finger and thumb, we can impart a very high speed to the stone as a result of its being involved in a low-speed collision between finger and thumb. If we imagine the cherry stone to be one molecule, and the finger and thumb each to represent a group of converging molecules, this analogy gives a good picture of molecular acceleration. 5. Vapor In a gas, or vapor, the molecules have overcome the attraction that held them together as a liquid. They are therefore much farther apart. The volume of a pound of steam at atmospheric pressure is 1600 times the volume of a pound of boiling water. In a vapour, as the molecules have overcome their mutual attraction, their movement is quite free, and is limited only by collision with each other and with the walls of the container. The difference between a gas and a vapour is partly one of definition and partly one of behaviour. A vapour is called a vapour when it is at a temperature at which it can exist as a liquid, provided the pressure is sufficient. If a vapour is hotter than the temperature at which it can exist as a liquid, however great the pressure, it is called a gas. A gas obeys certain well-established laws regarding its change of volume with pressure or temperature, while a vapour obeys the rules imperfectly. 6. Surface effects. At the surface of water, two things are happening. A few molecules acquire extra energy from their neighbours and travel so fast relatively that they can overcome their mutual attraction and jump out of the liquid. A hail of air or vapour molecules is raining down on the water surface. The rain of air molecules knocks most of the ambitious water molecules back into the liquid again but some lucky ones escape. The air contains some water molecules because it always carries some moisture, so that although some water molecules are jumping from the water surface, some airborne water molecules are diving back into the liquid. 7. Heat is energy. Heat is just a form of energy. When heat is added to a substance, it is stored in the substance as extra molecular movement. Energy can be used to move masses of molecules in bulk, and then we call it mechanical energy, and the result is mechanical motion. The greater the weight to be moved, the greater the energy needed. Similarly, the greater the number of molecules to be heated, that is, to be speeded up, the greater is the energy needed as heat. 8. Drying. Let us consider a puddle. It is a dull, sultry day with no wind. A few molecules of water are jumping out of the puddle. Some of them escape into the air over the puddle until the overlying air contains so many water molecules that just as many dive back into the puddle as are jumping out of it. Since the escaping molecules take their energy with them, and since they stole their extra energy from their fellows, it follows that the total energy in the puddle is reduced, its temperature is lowered, fewer molecules try to escape, a balance is reached, so the puddle does not dry up any more. If the sun comes out, the puddle is warmed, and its molecules move faster, so that more can jump out than are diving back, so the puddle starts drying up again. The heat of the sun starts air currents, and the air above the puddle, which was laden with air molecules, is wafted away from the puddle surface, so that the puddle can dry up still faster. If foggy air comes along, conditions are reversed. Such air carries more moisture than it can hold, and some of the water molecules join up as liquid droplets, which will fall into the puddle and it will get bigger. If the puddle is colder than the damp air, more water molecules will dive into it than are jumping out, and this will make the puddle bigger still. The escape of high-speed molecules from a liquid, evaporation or drying, causes a reduction of energy in the remaining liquid molecules. 
The consequent drop of the liquid temperature causes the evaporation or drying to slow down, unless heat energy is added to the liquid to keep up its molecular activity. This effect is very clearly noticed by standing in a breeze after perspiring. The breeze carries away the escaping molecules, their energy is lost to the perspiration, which drops in temperature and we feel chilled. 9. What pressure is? The pressure exerted by a gas or vapour is due to the myriads of impacts of the molecules bombarding the surface enclosing the vapour. If we halve the number of the molecules, without changing their speed by a change of temperature, in a given space, we halve the pressure because we have halved the bombarding missiles. If we add heat to a gas or vapour in a vessel, we increase the speed of the molecules and therefore the temperature rises. The faster moving molecules demand more room, so the vapour tends to expand. If we prevent expansion by keeping the vessel closed, the faster moving molecules, having the same density as before, must produce a heavier bombarding effect, which shows as an increase of pressure. 10. Vapour pressure if the pressure on the surface of a liquid is caused by the rain of air or vapour molecules, it follows that those molecules trying to jump out of the liquid must be exerting a pressure on the air or vapour above the liquid. The pressure at which the escape of molecules from the liquid just balances the overlying pressure is called the vapour pressure of the liquid. 11. Boiling Put cold water into an open vessel under atmospheric pressure. Add heat to the water. The molecules move about faster as more heat is added. This increase of water energy is shown as a rising temperature. More molecules try to jump out of the liquid. Its vapour pressure rises. Most of the adventurous water molecules get knocked back into the liquid, so that practically the whole of the added heat energy is retained as increased molecular speed in the liquid. As the addition of heat proceeds, we reach a point where the upward bombardment by jumping molecules overcomes the downward bombardment of the overlying air or vapour molecules. That is to say, the liquid vapour pressure overcomes the overlying pressure. The speeding water molecules, having won the battle, can now leave the water freely, providing they receive sufficient energy to enable them to overcome their attraction for their comrades. Any additional heat put into the water merely shoots off more vapour molecules. It is impossible to raise the temperature of, that is to increase the energy in, the water, because this would increase the vapour pressure which cannot rise because it has already overcome the overlying pressure. The particular temperature at which this state occurs is called the boiling point. 12. Effect of increased pressure If we close up the vessel and pump air into it so that there is a considerable pressure above the liquid, there are now more air or vapour molecules bombarding the liquid surface. It will therefore be more difficult for liquid molecules to fly off. More will be knocked back. In order to make a certainty of escape, the liquid vapour pressure must be increased to overcome the greater overlying pressure. The temperature must be higher, which means that the boiling point must rise with increase of pressure. 13. Effect of reduced pressure If we attach a vacuum pump to the vessel and pump out much of the air, there will be fewer air molecules raining down on the surface. The liquid molecules suffer less interference and can escape more easily. The water can exert the necessarily vapour pressure at a lower temperature. So the boiling point of a liquid falls with reduced pressure. 14. Heat of vaporization. When heat is added to liquid which is at its boiling point, the flyaway molecules take the added energy with them. They require it to overcome the attraction of their liquid comrades. Once sufficient energy has been added to bring the liquid to boiling point and win the vapour pressure battle, the liquid can gain no more energy. Any attempt to add more energy to the liquid just produces more vaporised molecules. 
The escaping molecules require two rations of energy to escape. They have their ration of liquid energy, and if they pick up a sufficient extra ration to overcome their mutual attractions, they escape. The first ration is their liquid heat, sensible heat, or kinetic energy. The second is the heat of vaporization, latent heat, or potential energy. 15. Condensation Suppose that we have a vessel supplied with steam at a constant pressure, and that we spray a little cold water into the vessel. The molecules in the cold water are moving slowly, so that the vapour pressure is low. The high-speed steam molecules bombarding the water meet little opposition, and can plunge joyfully into the water, transferring their energy to the water. This increases the speed into the water, transferring their energy to the water. This increases the speed of the water molecules. The water temperature rises. Its vapour pressure rises. This process, in which some of the steam molecules are converted into water, will go on until the vapour pressure of the water is the same as that of the steam. This process is called condensation. Condensation, under the conditions just described, where there is an excess supply of steam compared to the supply of water, results in the water being raised to the temperature of the steam, that is to say, to the appro appropriate boiling point. Suppose that we spray an excess of cold water through the vessel, which is being supplied with a relatively small amount of steam. The steam molecules will plunge into the water, but as the quantity of water is large compared to the amount of steam, the water will not be heated up very much, its vapour pressure will be low. This enables the steam molecules to go on diving into the water until the pressure of the steam has been so reduced as to balance the low vapour pressure of the water. In these circumstances, the pressure of the steam is reduced until it is the same as the vapour pressure of the slightly heated water. Condensation with excess water reduces the steam temperature and pressure. It creates a partial vacuum. This is the way a jet condenser works. Steam molecules can bombard any substance, solid, liquid, or gaseous, and if the molecules of the substance are moving slower than the steam molecules, the steam molecules will give up energy in speeding up the slower molecules. The steam molecules, having thus lost energy, will be moving slower, and some of them will find that they have not enough energy to overcome their mutual attraction. They will therefore come together again as water. This will occur on the surface of a cool metal and is the explanation of the working of a surface condenser. Both surface condensers and jet condensers were invented by James Watt in 1765. 16. Melting. A solid differs from a liquid in that the molecules arrange themselves in a form where they exert the greatest possible attraction for one another. In such an arrangement, they are locked together, and cannot move independently. Their movement is limited to vibration. When a solid is heated, its molecules vibrate faster, until, at a certain point, some molecules are able to tear themselves away from their fellows and move independently. This is the process called melting. As in vaporization, the melted molecules take their extra energy with them, and prevent further rise of temperature of the solid. The temperature at which this takes place is called the melting point. 17. Heat transfer. If heat is added to a metal vessel, which contains liquid or vapour, the molecules of the metal vibrate faster. These vibrating molecules strike the fluid molecules' blows which increase the speed of the fluid molecules. In this way, heat energy is transferred to a liquid or vapour. If a liquid or vapour inside a vessel is hotter than the metal of the vessel, the faster-moving fluid molecules strike the metal molecules and start them vibrating faster. In this way, heat energy can be transferred from a fluid to a metal container. Heat energy must flow from more energetic particles to those with less energy. Substances, therefore, always tend to equalise in temperature if they are in contact. 18. Conduction, Convection, Radiation When a solid is heated, the vibrations of the heated molecules are transferred to their neighbours by a kind of shoulder jostling process. 
In a liquid or vapor, the molecules transfer added heat to their neighbors by collisions. These forms of heat transfer by impact are called conduction. Materials vary greatly in the speed with which they will transfer heat by conduction. Solid metals are excellent conductors. Non-metals are poor conductors. Liquids are generally worse conductors than solids, and gases or vapors are the worst conductors of all. There is a method by which liquids and gases can receive heat quite quickly, in spite of being poor conductors. Nearly all substances expand or get bigger when heated, because their more energetic molecules demand more elbow room. When a liquid or vapor is in contact with a hotter metal, the fluid molecules alongside the metal get speeded up almost instantly, although they transfer the movement to their neighbors slowly. These more active molecules demand more room. The hot layer expands and is therefore lighter than the remaining fluid. The hot layer rises and cooler fluid flows in to replace it and is in turn brought into contact with the hot surface. This process is called convection and is just a combination of short distance conduction and movement. The molecules of a hot substance, in addition to transferring heat energy by molecular impacts, also have the property of transmitting energy as radiations across empty space. The sun's energy reaches the earth by this means. From a steam user's point of view, radiation is of no importance, as steam receives and gives up its heat by conduction and convection. Although the boiler metal may receive heat by radiation, and the steam pipe may give up heat by radiation. 19. Lagging. Gases are bad heat conductors, and they absorb and transfer heat principally by convection. If a gas can be kept in contact with a hot surface in such a way that convection cannot take place, heat transfer will be slow. Lagging materials, diamet diatomite, cork, asbestos, hair, etc., entangle air and impede its convection movement. That is why they prevent a surface losing much heat. Some cheap lagging materials act more as non-conductors than as non-convectors. 20. Saturated steam. When vapor is at a temperature corresponding to the liquid boiling point appropriate to its pressure, it is said to be saturated. When no liquid is present at that temperature, it is called dry saturated. 20. Saturated steam. When vapor is at a temperature corresponding to the liquid boiling point appropriate 21. Superheated steam. As long as steam is in the presence of water, it is impossible to raise the temperature of the steam above the appropriate boiling point. Any attempt to add more heat energy will simply vaporize more water. If heat is added to steam that is not in contact with water, the steam molecules will become still more energetic and will jostle each other more rapidly. The temperature will rise, the steam is superheated. Superheated steam occupies more space than it did in the saturated state, because the more active molecules drive each other further apart. As explained in section 9, if the steam is confined in a closed vessel, the extra molecular energy added in superheating will result in an increase of pressure. 22. The cooling of steam. Saturated steam has only just sufficient energy to keep it in the vapor state. When it gives up heat to a cooler body, some of it condenses, and the condensing molecules give up all the potential energy that they took on as their extra ration when they overcame their liquid attraction. If superheated steam is cooled, the superheat must for first be given up. Were some molecules to become liquid while others were superheated, the more active superheated molecules would goad the lazy liquid molecules back into vaporous activity, so that superheated steam must first part with its superheat before it can condense. 23. Wet steam. If saturated steam is in rapid, turbulent motion through a pipe on whose surface some of it is condensing, some of the water may be swept along with the steam, which then becomes a mixture of true vapor and liquid droplets. 
steam in this condition is called wet steam. There is another way in which steam can become wet after expanding in an engine or turbine. In this type of wet steam, the moisture is much more finely divided, and the steam is an extremely fine mist. Steam will also be wet if water drops or foam are carried out of a steam boiler with the steam. 24. Submerged Boiling If heat energy is added very fast to a liquid, the added energy does not spread instantly throughout the liquid. Convection and conduction both take time. A group of molecules may therefore receive sufficient energy to exert a vapour pressure high enough to overcome the pressure acting on the liquid. They will therefore escape in the form of a bubble. If the water is relatively cool, these bubbles will condense as they rise, and as they collapse they will make small sounds. The singing of a kettle is simply the sound made by streams of tiny condensing steam bubbles. If the liquid is at boiling point, the bubbles will get bigger as they rise, until they break the surface with quite a different noise. 25. Pressure Management We measure pressure as pounds per square inch. Assume we have a vessel 28 inches high, with a cross-section of 5 inches by 2 inches. Fill this vessel within a quarter of an inch of the top with water. It will hold a gallon or 10 pounds. The base of the vessel has an area of 5 inches by 2 inches, or 10 square inches. So we have 10 pounds pressing on 10 square inches, or 1 pound per square inch. We see from a column we see this we see from this that a column of water nearly 28 inches high exerts a pressure of 1 psi. 26. Atmospheric pressure all the molecules in the atmosphere are being drawn towards the Earth by its gravitational pull, and the air near the Earth's surface is being pressed upon or bombarded by the molecules in the upper air. It follows that the air nearer the Earth is at a greater pressure and is denser than the air in the upper regions. The upper air gets thinner farther from the Earth, until about 500 miles up we can say that there is no more air. The combined effect of all these miles of air is that the air molecules at the Earth's surface are bombarding everything with a force of nearly 15 psi, actually 14.696 psi at sea level in normal good weather. 27. Pressure Gauges When, at Christmas, or other Beano, we blow out the rolled up flat tube of a paper tongue toy, we measure the pressure exerted by our lungs by the length at which the paper tongue extends. The ordinary dial pressure gauge works exactly the same way. The steam, or other pressure, is led, in, is led into the inside of a curved flattened tube, which tends to straighten the greater the pressure. The pressure of the atmosphere is acting on the outside of the tube, tending to keep it flat and bent so that the pressure gauge really measures the amount by which the pressure being measured exceeds the atmospheric pressure. This pressure is called the gauge pressure. The real, or absolute, pressure is the gauge pressure plus the atmospheric pressure. So a gauge pressure of 15.3 psig is an absolute pressure of 30 psia, and a gauge pressure of 0 psig is an absolute pressure of 14.7 psia. 28. Mercury Gauges A column of water nearly 28 inches high exerts a pressure of 1 psi. Mercury is about 14 times as heavy as water, so that a column of mercury about 2 inches high will exert a pressure of 1 psi. To exert a pressure equal to that of atmosphere, 14.7 psi, will require a mercury column about 30 inches high. The ordinary dial pressure gauge, working by means of the curved flattened tube, is not very satisfactory for measuring pressures below atmospheric. Such low pressures are better measured with a mercury column made from a glass U-tube. If the U-tube has one end open and the other end connected to the vessel whose pressure is to be measured, the difference in heights of mercury in the two arms shows the difference above or below atmospheric pressure. If one arm of the U-tube is closed, and all the air is removed from the closed end, 
The pressure shown by the difference in heights of the two columns is the absolute pressure in inches of mercury, in.hg. If the pressure in the vessel is above atmospheric pressure, the vessel is said to be under pressure. If the pressure is below atmospheric pressure, the vessel is said to be under vacuum. If we are measuring vacuum, the mercury column may show two inches of absolute mercury pressure. In industry, this is usually called 28 inches of vacuum. That is to say, the pressure is 28 inches less than atmospheric pressure. The mercury gauge is not convenient for measuring high pressures owing to the great height of mercury that would be needed. 29. Thermometers. Nearly every substance expands as it gets hotter, but the amount of expansion for a given temperature rise differs greatly between substances. Solids expand less than liquids. Liquids expand less than gases. This property is used in most low temperature thermometers. When a mercury in glass thermometer is heated, the mercury expands more than the glass, so the mercury pushes its way up the tube and registers the temperature by its height on a suitable scale. 30. Temperature scales Fahrenheit. There are several thermometer scales. The scale in most general use in Britain is the Fahrenheit scale, and this is the scale used in this book. Fahrenheit was a German physicist who devised the mercury thermometer about 1720. His scale appears to us to be clumsy, having 32 degrees as the melting point of ice and 212 degrees as the boiling point of water, but with the means at his disposal, Fahrenheit is not to be blamed. He based his zero on the greatest cold he could get from a freezing mixture of snow and salt. This temperature he called zero. As his hot point, he used his body temperature, which he appears to have called 12 degrees. He then seems to have divided his 12 main degrees into eighths, like an ordinary foot rule. Using this scale, with a body temperature of 96 small eighth degrees, he gave the melting point of ice as 32 degrees. At that time, the boiling point of water was not known, and was later found to be 212 small Fahrenheit degrees. Subsequent measurements basing the Fahrenheit scale on a water freezing point of 32 degrees and a water boiling point of 212 degrees gave a body temperature of 98.4 degrees. 31. Centigrade. The rise of temperature on the Fahrenheit scale from water freezing point to water boiling point is 212 minus 32 equals 180 degrees. About 1740, Celsius suggested that a more rational scale would be to use water boiling point as zero and water freezing point as 100. Linnaeus persuaded Celsius to reverse his scale and the centigrade scale with water freezing point at zero and water boiling point at 100 was made public in 1745. This scale is used for all laboratory and scientific purposes and is used in an increasing number of industries. 32. Heat measurement. Suppose we add equal quantities of heat to four vessels, each containing an equal weight of one of four different liquids water, alcohol, pyrene, and mercury. If the water is raised in temperature by 10 degrees Fahrenheit, the alcohol will rise by 16 degrees Fahrenheit, the pyrene by 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and the mercury by 303 degrees Fahrenheit. Clearly, substances vary in their heat capacity, and some rise in temperature much more for a given heat addition than others. So we cannot use temperature rise as a measure of heat addition without specifying the substance being heated. The standard unit of heat is the quantity of heat needed to raise the temperature of one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit at room temperature. This amount of heat energy is called a British thermal unit, or BTHU, or BTU. If the centigrade scale is being used, the amount of heat needed to raise one pound of water by one degree Celsius centigrade is the centigrade heat unit, or CHU, or pound calorie. One CHU equals 1.8 BTU. Now the unit of heat, the BTU, cannot be measured directly on any kind of meter. 
If we had 10 BTU, this would either warm 1 pound of water 10 degrees, or 10 pounds of water 1 degree, or 100 pounds of water 1 tenth degree. Consequently, in order to measure heat flow or heat addition, we must measure a change of temperature in a measured amount of material, and the amount of heat that the material can carry, absorb, or give up must be known. 33. Specific heat. The amount of heat that a substance can hold relative to water is called the specific heat, and is the amount of heat in heat units needed to raise the temperature of one pound of the substance by one degree of temperature. The specific heats of the liquids just mentioned are water, 1.0, alcohol, 0.63, pyrene, 0.20, mercury, 0.033. The specific heats are not constant, but vary with temperature and pressure. The specific heat of steam at low pressure and moderate temperature is about half that of water. The specific heat is the same whether measured as BTU per degree Fahrenheit or CHU per degree centigrade. 34. The steam tables. We are now in a position to understand everything in the steam table except entropy and Gibbs's function. Entropy is a somewhat obscure quality, and refers to the availability of power energy in steam. It is generally only used by power engineers, but its proper understanding is of great help in all steam problems. It will be dealt with in Chapter 2. Gibbs's function is simply an arithmetical shortcut, and its use will be described in the next chapter. As far as heating is concerned, neither entropy nor Gibbs's function need be used. The remainder of this chapter will be devoted to a study of the steam tables, and the uses that can be made of the information they provide for solving all heating problems. Steam tables are printed on pages 821 to 836. Table 1 gives the properties of saturated steam. Table 2 the properties of superheated steam. The diagrams, figures 1, 2, and 3, are drawn from the information given in Table 1. Turn to the steam tables and study them. Get quite familiar with them. They will prove good friends. 35. Pressure and boiling point. The first three columns of the saturated steam table show the water boiling points corresponding to various gauge and absolute pressures. It has already been explained, sections 10 to 12, that high pressure calls for a high vapour pressure to permit boiling, and this can only be obtained by a higher temperature. Low pressure only needs a low vapour pressure to win the boiling battle, so that the temperature can be low. Figure 1 is a curve, drawn from the steam table, showing the relation between boiling temperature and pressure over the low pressure range. There are six ways in which advantage can be taken of this useful relation. 1. The low temperature evaporation of delicate products. 2. The use of low pressure steam for evaporation. 3. The multiple effect evaporator. 4. The steam accumulator. 5. Flash cooling. 6. Lowering boiler pressures. Some of these can be dealt with at once, but others must wait till we have delved deeper into the steam tables. 36. Low, pressure, uh, low temperature evaporation. If for some reason it is necessary to boil a watery liquid at low temperature, the steam table and figure 1 show that this can be done by boiling under vacuum. For example, milk consists largely of water and is damaged by high temperatures. By boiling milk in a closed evaporator whose outlet is connected to a condenser and vacuum pump, it is possible to concentrate it at about 25 inches vacuum, when the temperature can be kept below 140 degrees Fahrenheit, to prevent destruction of minerals. 37. Use of low pressure steam. Suppose we have process washings to be evaporated, and suppose there is a lavish supply of low-pressure steam in the form of, say, exhaust from pumps. 
Assume that hitherto the washings have been concentrated under atmospheric pressure using 20 psi g steam in the evaporator heating surface. The 20 psi steam must be condensing and giving up its latent heat to the heating surface at its saturation temperature, which the steam table tells us is 259 degrees Fahrenheit. The washings will be boiling at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. There is therefore a 47 degrees Fahrenheit temperature difference across the evaporator heating surface. Suppose that, instead of using 20 psi steam, we wish to use pump exhaust at atmospheric pressure with a temperature of 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Low temperature heat does not pass so readily through a heating surface as high temperature heat because the molecules do not vibrate so energetically at low temperature. The shoulder jostling process is not so vigorous. We must therefore arrange for a larger temperature difference across the heating surface. If we decide on a 40 degree Fahrenheit difference, the washings must be made to boil at 212 minus 60 equals 152 degrees Fahrenheit. The steam table tells us that we must, with the aid of condenser and vacuum pump, do the evaporation under a vacuum of about 22 inches, when the boiling point of the water or washings will be 152 degrees Fahrenheit. 38. Multiple effect evaporation. Instead of using pump exhaust, we might have used vapor off another evaporator. Such an arrangement can be made to use the heat in steam over and over again, each vessel receiving steam boiled off its predecessor, which of course must be working at a higher pressure. This is called multiple effect evaporation, and is dealt with in chapter 17. 39. Lowered boiler pressures. The lower the steam pressure in a boiler, the lower is the boiling temperature of the water. It will be seen later that for heating and process purposes, steam should be always used at the lowest possible pressure. The lower the water boiling temperature, the more easily will the heat from the furnace gases pass into the boiler. It will also be possible to extract more heat from the flue gases. The improvement will be very small, but it will be there, and will be greater where no economizer is fitted. Care must be taken in reducing the working pressure of a water tube boiler, as the tubes may not be large enough to pass the greater volume of steam which a reduced pressure entails. Carryover, or priming, might occur. The water circulation in the tubes may be so slowed down by the congestion due to the large volume of steam that the tubes may get overheated and fail. With any type of boiler, a reduction of pressure may not be possible, owing to steam pipes being too small. The volume columns in the steam table show that steam at 40 psig has double the volume of steam at 100 psig, and that steam at 100 psig has double the volume of steam at 220 psig. Table 3 shows the amount of steam that can be expected to flow through pipes under various conditions. Any reduction of pressure can be, can be made, should be made. There are other advantages in the boiler house, apart from improved heat transfer. The lower the pressure, the less the power needed by the feed pump. The lower the pressure, the less total heat is needed for each pound of steam. This is only true below about 450 psi. Above this pressure, the reverse occurs. 40. Heat. The 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th columns in the saturated steam table are the heat, or energy, values. The first heat column shows the heat needed to bring one pound of water from the freezing point to the boiling point, corresponding to any particular pressure. In section 12, it has been explained that higher pressure calls for a higher boiling temperature. To, to reach this higher temperature naturally requires more heat. This water heating heat is the sensible heat of the liquid. The next column shows the amount of heat needed to vaporize completely one pound of water, which is already at boiling point. This heat is the heat energy necessary to enable escaping molecules to overcome their mutual attraction and exist in a more open formation. 
If it is added to a liquid at boiling point, it forces the molecules apart and makes them overcome their attraction for each other. It is called heat of vaporization, or latent heat. This heat energy is the potential energy that must be given up during condensation. The third heat column shows the sum of the first two, namely the total heat needed to raise one pound of water from freezing point to boiling point and completely vaporize it into dry, saturated steam. It is the total heat in steam because, as explained in section 14, vaporizing water molecules take both their energy rations with them. The last heat column, headed Gibbs, is for use in the arithmetic of the use of steam for power purposes, and is described in chapter 2. 41. Sensible, or liquid, heat. If the specific heat of water were always 1.0, the figure for liquid heat would always be equal to the boiling temperature, or saturation temperature, as it is often called, minus 32. But the specific heat rises with temperature, and the simple relation does not hold good at high pressure. The change of specific heat with temperature can be seen by comparing boiling temperature with liquid heats. It will be seen that changes in the specific heat of water can be ignored at ordinary low process procedures. Mistakes are frequent in water heat calculations due to failure to add or subtract 32. This is the chief disadvantage of the Fahrenheit scale. Such errors cannot occur with the centigrade scale. Water at 69.7 degrees centigrade contains 69.7 CHU. This heat that must be added to a liquid to raise its temperature up to the boiling point can be detected by our senses as causing a rise of temperature. If we put our hand into water that is being heated, our sense of warmth tells us that it is getting warmer. If we put a thermometer into it, our sense of sight tells us that the temperature is rising. So this liquid heat, whose addition can be detected by our senses, is called sensible heat. 42. Latent heat. The heat energy needed to overcome the liquid molecular attraction and cause water molecules to escape as vapour does not show itself as a rise of temperature. Our senses only perceive the change of state from liquid to vapour. Only our memory tells us that energy had to be added. This heat of vaporization lies hidden in the steam as potential energy, and is therefore called latent heat. We see from the table that as the pressures rise, the amount of latent heat gets less, until at a very high pressure it disappears altogether. At high pressures, the vapour molecules are more tightly squashed together than at low, low pressures. If the pressure is raised sufficiently, there must come a point where the volume occupied by the vapour is the same as that occupied by the liquid. This point is called the critical pressure, and is 3208 psia for water. If this critical pressure water and steam occupy the same space, the molecules must be equally closely packed in both states. To affect vaporization clearly does not call for any extra energy ration, because the vapor molecules are no farther apart than liquid molecules. At the critical pressure, therefore, as the critical pressure of 705.6 Fahrenheit is reached, the water changes instantly, quietly, and without boiling, into vapor. We have one pound of pressure at 705 degrees Fahrenheit one instant, and one pound of steam at 706 degrees Fahrenheit the next instant. There is no constant temperature boiling point while heat is being absorbed to affect evaporation. As the pressure increases, therefore, the amount of energy called for by escaping molecules must be less, because their possible freedom, or distance apart, gets less the more tightly they are packed. At reduced pressure, the difference between the space occupied by vapour and water molecules increases, so that more energy is required to bridge the gap between liquid and vapour. Inspection of the volume columns of the steam table tells us that steam at atmospheric pressure occupies 1600 times the volume of water, whereas steam at 25-inch vacuum occupies nearly 9000 times the volume of water. 
Clearly, a molecule escaping at 25-inch vacuum will require more energy to justify its escape into its larger Lebensraum. There is therefore a simple explanation for the increase in, of latent heat with reduced pressure, and for a lower latent heat at high pressure. 43. The heating value of low-pressure steam. What can be done to make use of the fact that the latent heat of steam is greater than the lower the pressure? When steam is used inside a heating surface, coil, pipe, or jacket, the steam condenses and gives up its latent heat. All the liquid or sensible heat remains in the condensate, which is removed by the trap. The lower the pressure, the greater the latent heat, and the less the sensible heat. It follows that the greatest amount of heat can be obtained from the condensation of heating steam by using the lowest possible pressure. Where the heating surface drains slowly, the condensate will sometimes give up some of its sensible heat. This is, slow, this is usually unintentional, and is generally due to bad design, insufficient fall, faulty trapping, etc., though occasionally a thermostatic trap is used to keep the heating surface partly waterlogged so as to use the sensible heat of the condensate. It will be seen from the steam table that steam at 20 psi A contains 5% more latent heat than steam at 65 psi A. If, therefore, a plant could be adapted to use 20 psi steam instead of steam at 65 psi, we should use 5% less steam. As 20 psi A steam contains 2.5% less total heat than 65 psi A steam of 2.5% of coal will be saved in the boilers, giving a total saving of 7.5%. Figure 2 shows the proportions of latent heat and sensible heat in low-pressure steam. The latent heat is shown below the sensible heat for diagrammatic clarity. Figure 2 shows how much good heat is retained in the condensate at higher pressures. As a general rule, sensible heat is not used in a heating surface because it requires special measures, more plant, etc. There may be many cases where advantage cannot be taken of this useful steam property, because the heating surface in the plant may be too small to give a proper heat transfer rate. Some processes require a certain minimum temperature, the vulcanization of rubber, for example, and a sufficient pressure must be used to give such special temperatures. One disadvantage of very low pressures is the need for larger steam mains. The volume columns in the table show that steam at 20 psi A has more than three times the volume of steam at 65 psi A. Table 3 shows that steam flow at 20 psi A will be about half that of 65 psi A. Such a reduction in pressure may therefore not be possible, but any lowering of the pressure is a step in the right direction. 44. Flash. Suppose there is a vessel heated by a steam coil taking steam at 50 psi A, and suppose the condensate from the trap is piped to a condensate tank open to the atmosphere. Table 1 tells us that each pound of condensate, water, at 50 psi A, contains 250 BTU. Each pound of water at atmospheric pressure and boiling temperature contains 180 BTU. The high-pressure water, or condensate, therefore contains 50, 70 BTU more than it can hold at atmospheric pressure. The molecules in the hot condensate from the trap are moving at such a speed as to exert a vapour pressure of 50 psi A, whereas in the condensate tank this is only opposed by a pressure of 14.7 psi A. There will therefore be a great flash of flyaway molecules until the water energy has been so reduced that it can exert a vapour pressure no more than atmospheric pressure. The heat energy that each pound of condensate must get rid of in this way is 70 BTU. The latent heat of steam at atmospheric pressure is 971 BTU. It follows that 70 divided by 971 equals 0 0.072 pounds of steam will flash off each pound of condensate, i.e. 7.2%. In addition to the 70 BTU of latent heat, this flash steam will carry away 180 multiplied by 0 0.072, 
equals 13 BTU of sensible heat. Flash steam can be piped to an evaporator, calorifier, or vat, or can be used for heating in a contact heater. Figure 2 shows the amount of heat that will be liberated as flash if condensate is reduced to atmospheric pressure. It shows clearly how the latent heat rises and the flash drops with lower pressures. Flash is good, valuable heat and should not be wasted, but it is a nuisance and needs piping and plant for its collection. If steam can be used for heating at or below atmospheric pressure, not only is there a bigger supply of latent heat than with pressure steam, but there will be no flash to waste or collect. Figure 3 shows the percentage of flash steam produced when the pressure on condensate is reduced. Tables 4 and 5 at the end of the book give figures for flash set out in different ways. Suppose we have condensate at 110 psig, leaving a trap and discharging atmospheric pressure into a flash tank. How much flash steam will be liberated? In figure 3, the intersection of the 110 psi line and the atmospheric flash tank pressure curve heavy line occurs just below 14% flash. Table 4 gives the flash under these conditions as 13.94%. Sometimes, the hot condensate can be returned under pressure to the boilers, where there is of course no loss by flash and heat pressure steam can then be used in heating surfaces with the advantage of a higher rate of heat transfer. Where arrangements can be made to collect and use the flash steam, there is also no loss in using high pressure steam. However, both these arrangements require more and special plant, and their application is limited. High pressures mean high temperatures, so that the heat losses will always be higher. The use of high pressure steam can only be justified if the process temperatures or the high cost of the plant call for it. High pressure steam should, if possible, first pass through an engine and generate power, the exhaust steam then being used for heating. The collection of flash steam, the arrangement of flash tanks, and the utilization of flash steam are dealt with in detail in chapter 14. 45. Steam Accumulators Suppose we have a steady demand for heating steam, and we have an engine working intermittently like a winding engine or a rolling mill engine. We can store the exhaust steam from the engine in an accumulator by blowing the exhaust steam into water that is at a lower temperature than the saturation temperature of the blown-in steam. The steam will condense in the water, raise its temperature, and the pressure will rise. By reducing the pressure on the water in the accumulator, the stored energy will flash off as steam at lower pressure. Suppose the accumulator contains 10,000 gallons of water at 240 degrees Fahrenheit, corresponding to a pressure of 10 psig, and suppose that the engine exhausts at 35 psg, 10%, wet at the rate of 30,000 pounds per hour more than the process demands for two minutes and then stops for a few minutes. The water in the accumulator is 100,000 pounds at 240 degrees Fahrenheit containing 208 BTU per pound. The total heat in the accumulator is 20,800,000 BTU. The surplus engine exhaust is 30,000 multiplied by 2 divided by 60 equals 1,000 pounds. This steam is 10% wet, so that there will be 100 times 250, the water heat at 35 psig, plus 900 multiplied by 1,174, the total heat of 35 psig steam, equals 1,081,600 BTU in the exhaust. If this exhaust steam is bubbled into the accumulator water, it will add its weight and its energy to that already there. There will be 101,000 pounds of water containing 21,881,600 BTU. Each pound will contain 216.6 BTU, corresponding to a pressure of 14 psig. If the accumulator feeds a 10 psig main, each pound of water can give up 8.6 BTU, or a total heat of 868,600 BTU. The latent heat of 10 psig steam in 
152 BTU, so that the amount of steam flashed off the accumulator will be 912 pounds. Steam accumulators are large, and where high pressures are wanted, costly. A shell-type boiler, Lancashire, Cornish, Economic, Vertical, etc., acts as an accumulator if the pressure is allowed to fall when a rising load occurs, and to rise with a reduced load. An average Lancashire boiler working at 100 psi will store 320 pounds of steam if the pressure is allowed to rise at 110 psi. This corresponds to about 3 minutes normal boiler output. If, when a sudden demand for steam occurs, the pressure is allowed to drop from 110 psi to 90 psi, the boiler will give up an extra 630 pounds of steam in addition to its normal output. This is equivalent to over 5 minutes ordinary steaming. Spare Lancastershire boilers can sometimes be adapted to act as accumulators, with comparatively small modifications. In 1943, a battery of four old Lancashire boilers was rigged up to act as an accumulator in a London factory. With a pressure range between 10 psig and 40 psig, they had a combined storage of 24,000 pounds of steam. Accumulators are discussed at length in Chapter 16. 46. Flash Cooling Suppose we have a dilute process liquid at 200 degrees Fahrenheit, and suppose that the next process requires a temperature of 150 degrees Fahrenheit. There may be a heat exchanger available, there may not. Heat exchangers are costly, and they need a temperature drop across the heating or cooling surface. Another way of cooling is to spray the liquid into an empty vessel connected to a condenser and vacuum pump. If a 22.5 inch vacuum is maintained in the vessel, the steam table tells us that the liquid must boil at 150 degrees Fahrenheit. It will therefore flash off its surplus heat and reduce its temperature from 200 degrees Fahrenheit to 150 degrees Fahrenheit. The steam table tells us that each pound of liquor must flash off 50 BTU. The latent heat of steam at 22.5 inches vacuum is 1008 BTU so that 50 divided by 1008 equals 0.05 pounds of flash steam will be produced from each pound of liquor. This affects a 5% concentration of the liquor, and if the condenser takes the form of a contact heater, process water can be heated with the flash vapour, or space heating can be done. 47. Superheated Steam the superheat table shows the volume, total heat, and entropy for superheated steam over a wide range of pressure and superheat. The values at saturation or boiling temperature are included for comparison. 48. Wire drawing. If the pressure on hot water is reduced, we have seen that any surplus heat is given up as self-evaporation, or flash. What happens if the pressure on dry saturated steam is reduced? Suppose we allow dry saturated steam at 150 degree, degrees psig to pass through a reducing valve into a low pressure main at 50 psig. Saturated steam at 150 psig contains 1196.6 BTU per pounds of total heat. In expanding through the reducing valve, the steam does no work, so it still holds those 1196.6 BTU. If we look up 50 psig steam in the superheat table, we see that 1196.6 BTU is the total heat of steam at 328 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature of 50 psig saturated steam is 298 degrees Fahrenheit, so that the reducing, expansion, throttling, or wire drawing has added 30 degrees Fahrenheit of superheat, although the actual temperature has fallen from 366 degrees Fahrenheit to 328 degrees Fahrenheit. When steam, particularly wet steam, expands through a valve that is cracked open, it is very apt to score the valve seat with grooves that look as if a wire had been drawn through the valve, hence the name wire drawing for the expansion of steam that does no work. Another explanation of the word wire drawing is that steam passing through an orifice is like a wire being drawn through a die. 
This superheating by expansion only occurs to saturated steam below 450 psi. At higher pressures, there are other effects, because the reduction in latent heat becomes more rapid than the increase in liquid heat. For example, saturated steam at 750 psi blown through a reducing valve gets wetter down to 450 psi and then gets drier until about 240 psi, it is again dry saturated steam. If it is still allowed to expand, it superheats itself. Steam used for direct heating in a blower or injector often gets superheated by expansion in the blower and losses can occur this way. If 30 psig dry saturated steam is blown into a vat or tank containing 4 feet 6 inches of liquor, there will be a pressure reduction in the blower of 28 psi, and the steam will be superheated by 38 degrees Fahrenheit. It is unlikely that 4 feet 6 inches of hot liquor can remove 38 degrees Fahrenheit of superheat and condense all the steam during its short passage through the liquor. Some steam will break the surface and be lost. Table 6 shows the superheating effect of reducing the pressure on dry saturated steam by passage through an orifice or valve. 49. D superheating. As pointed out above, and explained more fully in Chapter 5, superheated steam is often considered to be bad steam for use for heating. It may therefore be necessary to de-superheat it by passing it through a de-superheater, which adds a spray of distilled water to the steam. The superheat gives itself up in evaporating some of the sprayed water. In the case considered at the beginning of section 48, the amount of superheating energy was 17 BTU. This is to be removed by evaporating water in the de-superheater. If we assume that the de-superheating water is pumped into the steam at 200 degrees Fahrenheit, it must first be heated to 298 degrees Fahrenheit, the boiling temperature, at 50 psig, before evaporation can begin. Sensible heat in water at 200 degrees Fahrenheit, 168 BTU. Sensible heat in water at 298 degrees Fahrenheit, 267 BTU. Difference, 99 BTU. Latent heat of steam at 50 psig, 912 BTU. Therefore, every pound of steam de-superheated will evaporate 17 divided by 99 plus 912 equals 0 0.0168 pounds of water. This increases the weight of superheated steam, leaving the de-superheater by 1.68%. 50. Superheat and Steam Distribution in certain circumstances, the superheat given to steam by reducing its pressure may be very useful. Steam is sometimes very wet. If this wet steam goes into heating the surface of a piece of plant, the extra condensate is just a nuisance. It has little heating value, but it coats the heating surface with an additional water film, and the extra water has to be handled by the trap, and the amount of flash steam is increased. If such wet steam can be expanded as soon as possible on its journey to the heating process, the superheat due to expansion will help to dry it. This increases the amount of steam reaching the process plant, and as the steam is at a lower pressure, it will have a higher latent heat. There may therefore be a twofold gain.